Hello, Bethel Community Church family. This is Pastor Rich with the devotion for Wednesday, July 8th. I've been going through, uh, I started last time with Psalm 2, looking at Messianic Psalms. And so today I'm looking at Psalm 8. And begin by reading Psalm chapter 8, verse 1 to 2, where it says, Lord, the word there is Yahweh, our Lord, the word there is Adonai, kind of Lord of us. So Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. I think that's ultimately seen in the person of Jesus, as we shall see. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Well, David begins by giving God the glory due his name. And part of this means to acknowledge him as Lord. He is Lord from first to last, Yahweh Adonai. Adonai refers to God being the master or owner of all, Lord of all. If God is the master and owner of all, then he must be our Lord too, and we should acknowledge him as such, just as David does in the psalm. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus speaking, said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? It's a really good question. So what does lordship mean? Well, imagine yourself as a house. You belong to God because he is Lord and master of everything, including you. God comes in to rebuild his house. But understand, he's not coming in just to do some minor tweaks here and there. He's, he's not just getting the drains right and stopping leaks in the roof. Rather, he is building a new house on the old site. He is building a house in which he intends to live one he feels at home in, one in which he would feel comfortable. Now you may have thought he was going to do some minor repairs and live in a rundown shack, but that's not his intention. He is building a palace, a temple in which to live, in which he will feel right at home. He is Lord, he is master and owner of the house. Acknowledging his lordship is realizing he has the right to do whatever he wants with his house. If you belong to God, then you're being transformed to the image of Jesus. It's a process, but he's making you into a new creation. This is the house in which he will feel at home. An Abraham Kuyper poem finished with the line, there is not an inch of any sphere of life of which Jesus Christ, the Lord, does not say mine. And so when he looks at our life, every single area, we might be thinking, that's mine, Jesus, don't touch it. He's saying mine. And he's going to change it. Then in Psalm 8, 3 to 9, we have the rest of the psalm. It says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, all the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So we're looking at weak, feeble man here, and we're seeing someone who's gonna be a represent, representation of us as well. Because the first one was Adam, but the second is Christ Jesus. But what is weak, miserable, sinful people compared to the works of, of a divine artist? In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47, it says, The first man, Adam, was of the dust of the earth. He was formed from the dust in the earth. Now, it's important for us to grasp that despite being made from but dust, our low position that we had, we were still created in God's image. We were made unique and special with great worth and value, and sin messed that up, but we're still created in God's image. In Genesis 1, verse 26 to 27, which Psalm 8 refers to, Says then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God placed creation under mankind's dominion. Then in Genesis 1:28 it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule, put it under our dominion, the earth. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. But we fell and when we fell, we fell hard. And the story of that is told in Genesis chapter three. 
So now what? Well, the psalmist, David here, gives us some really great news. We have another representative that is much superior to Adam. The first human representative was Adam. Through his sin, we lost it. We lost everything. We lost our, our lofty position and we fell far. Unfortunately, we cannot always choose our representatives. How many of you feel you're sometimes misrepresented by the government officials representing you in Washington State or Washington, D.C.? And you're thinking, I wish I had a different representative. Well, the first Adam represented the human race through sin. But the second Adam, Jesus, the final and perfect representative of the human race, regained what we lost. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45 to 49, it says, So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man, which is Jesus. Because of Jesus, we will be resurrected, given a glorified body, and exalted by God. And I believe David clearly had someone special in mind in verses 5 to 8 of Psalm 2, or, or Psalm 8. So in Psalm 8, verses 5 to 6, 5 to 6 of Psalm 8, I'm not sure I said that right, but Psalm 8, verse 5 to 6, says, You have made them, literally it could be you diminished him, took something away from him, so that he now lacks what he did not have before, or what he did not lack before. So you have made them, or him, a little lower than the angels. Now this is temporal, it's a temporary lowering, as well as spatial. He was made a little lower for a little while. And crowned them, or crowned him, with glory and honor. So exalted to the name that is above all names. Exalted, glory, and honor. You made them, or you made him, obviously I'm thinking of Jesus here, rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, or under his feet. David has a specific person he is pointing to as our representative, as our ultimate representative, and that person is clearly Jesus. Again, the word made in verse 5 is, I believe, not even referring to Adam. In fact, it's not referring to a created being. The word literally means to diminish or to lack, to take away from, or to deprive. It has the idea of being made to lack something that was not lacked before. This is someone who was not made but always existed, who had something diminished for a period of time. He was made to lack something or have something diminished. The idea of being a little lower than angels can be a temporal, temporal reference as well as spatial. That is, he was made a little lower than, he was diminished for a period of time. David, or the Holy Spirit through David, is talking about a human representative who was not created, but had something about him diminished in some way. Someone who would represent the human race and restore us to our created position as originally intended with glory and honor. The, this is the Philippians 2 passage of the Old Testament from my point of view. In Philippians 2, verse 6 to 11, talking about Jesus, it says, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Or as Psalm 8 says, you have set your glory in the heavens. And ultimately, the ultimate fulfillment of that, the ultimate representative of the human race in this is Jesus. And this is, of course, clarified in the New Testament as a reference to Jesus' incarnation. Jesus was humbled as incarnate man and was made for a little while lower than his ultimate position that he's going to have, and a little lower than the angels. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5 to 9, referring to our passage, to Psalm 8, it says, It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, Psalm 8, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. And putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, 
now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. What is he saying, the author of Hebrews? He's looking at this Psalm 8, saying Jesus is the ultimate representative that accomplishes this. We don't see everything that's subject to us because of our sinful nature and our failure. Jesus, everything is subject to him because he succeeded where we fail. He represents us. He is the reason he tasted death for everyone. He represented us in that. And so he restores to us that position with God of high standing and high honor. Jesus represents you. He represented you on the cross. This is the ultimate grace. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. This should be a great motivation to live for God. This is the kind of God we should willingly serve and strive to be like in character and goodness. So thank God today. Jesus represents you. He paid for your sin. He has restored you to a position of honor before God. He is the perfect representative. And while we can't choose our representatives, he has chosen you and he's represented you. And for this, we should be eternally grateful. Father, thank you so much for, first of all, the high position you put upon us as, as the crowning pinnacle of creation. That when you made everything, when you made us, you said it is very good. You made us in your image. And yet, Father, we all know, we feel it. I'm a sinful human being. My brothers and sisters who are watching this are sinful human beings. We know that we've failed. We know that we fall short. But thank you, you have given the ultimate representative on our behalf and the person of Jesus. And through his death on the cross, we die to sin. He did that for us. And through him being exalted to the heavens and raised from the dead and glorified, we will be too. Because of him, we have this incredible future awaiting us. And even an incredible present through the way you look at us now. Thank you for the representation of Jesus. Help us to represent you well to a world that does not know you, that because of us, your name would be glorified and you would be seen more clearly. And this we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.